thank you very much, Di. Um, I've got some recovery to do here from New Zealander consultant, commercially successful. <laughs> so, so, so let, let me say that um, I have lived in Australia since I was 12, and I have an Australian passport, and I am an Australian. I am no longer a consultant, and we shall see about commercially successful as we go down the track. But, but let me say that thank you very much, Di and Duncan and your team for welcoming me here tonight. Thank you all of you for coming along. Um, these are tough times for real bricks and mortar booksellers, the sort of people who you can actually come in and talk to and go to an event at their shop and so forth. Um, I think it's fair to say that they are even tougher times um, for independent bricks and mortar booksellers. And they are even tougher times again for regional independent and bricks and mortar booksellers. The fact that Di and Duncan um, are continuing to thrive in this environment, I think, attribute to what they are doing, their business sense, their ability to move, and of course the loyalty of people like yourselves who come along and support them. And I guess you're thinking, how can we continue to support them? Well, is this book? <laughs> <laughs> so, so let, let me just ask, how many of you have read The Rosie Project? Di, Duncan, can you see that? <laughs> Thank you. At least half of the room, well I'm hoping the other half of the room, not having read it or bought it, um, may consider buying it before the night is over, and I will be very happy to sign it. For the rest of you, let me just plant the following thought in your mind. Sometime in the next 12 months, some relative <laughs> or friend is going to need a gift. <laughs> And you know what you, you can imagine that moment, can't you? Oh, I'm going to get them! And you think, thank goodness, I bought a copy of that book soon to be a major film, signed by the author, <laughs> with the story behind it, appealing to young and old men and... Just a little aside here. Look, I'm only going to speak for half an hour, okay? But allow me a couple of little deviations, okay? Because... Um, as you can probably see, I'm a middle-aged bloke and I wrote a story about a 40-year-old bloke told in his voice from his perspective and I thought that probably blokes would want to read it in my naivety. <laughs> <laughs> because when it actually got in the hands of a publisher, they said, oh no, Graham, it's women who buy fiction. And I thought, you know, that's true. I will walk into a shop and book a prize winner here, you know, burial rights, whatever it is, you know whatever the latest, fabulous, brilliant Booker Prize winner, you know, Hilary Mantel, fabulous. And right next to it is a hundred unusual words. And think, woo, that's interesting. <laughs> and and the, the attraction is to the, even for a writer, is to the non-fiction. It's just a guy thing, I think. I think so it didn't show off or something like that. But when men finally manage to read the first couple of pages of the Rosie Project, they do actually seem to be able to keep turning the pages. So if you are a bloke out there and you're wondering whether you should read it, or if you're thinking of Cousin Fred, who's a bloke, is a possible recipient of the gift, don't tell him it's a love story, for goodness sake. <laughs> tell him it's about a bloke <laughs> who's struggling to find a woman. <laughs> He's got a few challenges, and this is how he goes about doing it. And he may or may not succeed, but he has a lot of fun along the way. And it's a comedy, okay? Um, because I think that the, the success of the book has come largely from it being, being a comedy, um, being a laugh out loud comedy. Um, but let me also just say, in tribute to, um, to Diane Duncan and others like them around Australia, um, yes, it's been number one, six weeks, I think, number one on the independent bestsellers book list. If you look at the overall booksellers list, you won't see it. Not in the top 10, never. We've made 11, we've made 12, but we've never quite over. We will, the time will come. <laughs> but that is after the heavy lifting is being done by the independent booksellers. And you're doing well around the world, but it's the independent booksellers in Australia who've done the heavy lifting and continue to do that. And for them, yeah, thank you very much. So what are we going to do for the remaining 28 minutes? I, I thought... That I thought that it might be interesting to talk about, well, to me anyway, but to you hopefully too, to talk about how I became a writer, a little bit about where the ideas and the characters for the Rosie Project 
came from. Are they based on real people? Is there a real Don Tilman out there? Um, and then how I went about um, how I went about writing the book um, and what's briefly what's happened since, which I think Di's done a good job of summarising anyway. And that'll leave us, you know, 15 minutes for questions, a bit longer if you like, as long as it takes. And then I'm very happy to do that book signing thing, and I'm sure they're very happy to send in lots and lots of books, you know. I'm sure it'll be discounted by 10 or more, won't they? Uh, <laughs> and I'll be happy to sign them in different colours or whatever it takes. Them. Okay. Oh, and, and by the way, where's the winemaker? He's here tonight, isn't he? Stand up. It, it's Brian, isn't it? Brian, and what's the, what's the winery called? Lightfoot. Lightfoot, Gordon, yeah, I remember that. Lightfoot, as in Gordon Lightfoot. Lightfoot Winery. I um, have been in the wine business, and I reckon this is a pretty nice drop of Shiraz Cabernet, so let me commend, uh, let me commend Brian Shiraz Cabernet to you. This is a, a, Cabernet, this is a Shiraz Cab Lightfoot Shiraz Cabernet fueled speech tonight, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I what can I say? Any school teachers here? Former school teachers? Okay, listen, I have a confession to make, but it may make the mothers and fathers here who've got kids at school who aren't doing very well in English. I didn't do very well either. I was a I, was, I hated school with a deep and abiding passion. And I actually I hated school because with coming from New Zealand, there were some shifts and so forth. I was a little bit of a fish out of water. People made fun of me. I was the shortest kid in the class. It was also, there was a reason I was the shortest kid in the class. I was two years younger than everybody else. One and a half to two years younger than everybody else. And if you want to be socially out of your depth, like Don Tillman, just try being the 15-year-old or 13-year-old when the girls are 15. You're not going to get a date, let me tell you. <laughs> you have no chance of a 13 year old boy getting a date with a 15 year old girl. It's just, it's just not going to happen. And it would be wrong to go out with a first form. So it's not going to happen either. So I, I learned that the one way I could sort of survive in class, because I was a reasonably sharp little guy, was by being a class clown. And I remember my fourth form English teacher. I was so utterly horrible. I cringe with how I behaved to her. I made her cry. She threw a book at me once, and all the time I was right. Yeah, she was in the room. No, I didn't say anything wrong, miss. Yeah, I did. Oh, you threw a book at me. I didn't know you were violent. I was just a horrible little 13 year old. And I was in sixth form, my last year of school, I was actually thrown out of my English class. My, in the first lesson, I had an argument with the teacher. I was being such an intellect. By the way, as a grown up, I know I was wrong. Uh, <laughs> but at the time, I was sure I was right. And she said, when you've changed your attitude, you can come back to class. And I didn't. <laughs> For the whole year, I never told my parents. And you know what? I was so scared. My parents put across the line of parent teacher night. And I said, did you speak to Mrs. Hunter? Yeah. You seem to be going along OK. <laughs> She seemed very nice. <laughs> okay, you know, tell, I know, tell. <laughs> and, and I was actually taught the school in English at the end of the year. And I remember running into her in the streets, and she wasn't entirely happy about <laughs> but, but that. Was, that so I, I, had, I had some ability in English, but it wasn't as though we were a top English school or anything, or anything like that, anyway. So, um, oh, there's a little bit of a story. Um, I told you I wasn't very good at dating. When I was a little bit older, uh, I was 20, I met this girl and she was really nice. And I asked her out on a date and she said yes. And I went round to her house to pick her up. The door opened and it was my English teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Utterly true story. <laughs> And two weeks ago, that girl who I'd not seen for 30 years turned up at one of these presentations. <laughs> and I don't know that I would have recognised her to tell the truth, but she came and she introduced herself, and her mother's still living, and I signed the book for her mum. <laughs> and, 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 she, and she got back to me by email and she said, Brian, mum certainly remembers you. Of course I said, dated the daughter, hadn't I? <laughs> she said, she always thought you'd go a long way. <laughs> Yeah, right. So, but I nursed in my mind the idea that I might write a book one day. It really was something, I, I don't know where it came from. But I read a lot, 
Um, and you know, I enjoyed reading mainly science fiction at that age, mainly what um, my teachers would have called junk. But I read a lot of junk, and it's all right. Just if you've got kids, don't argue with what they read. Just if they read, that's cool. So I was reading all this junk, and I wanted to write something. And so I was traveling around Australia with a friend at the time. I was 21 by then. And um, I was reading Hemingway, and I was reading Henry Miller. Um, and Henry Miller, I mean, Tropic Capricorn, Tropic Cancer, Nexus, Sexus, Plexus, I read the whole lot except the Ignition Nightmare, which was real garbage. Um, and I thought, I can write in this style, it doesn't look too hard. And you know what, if you try to write a few pages like Hemingway, or like, Hen and, and based on the experiences Henry Miller had, this is Graham at 21 trying to write about his radical sexual experiences, <laughs> of which I had none. <laughs> It doesn't make for very good reading or writing. And I showed it to my friend, the combi, we were travelling around, and I said, what do you think, John? And John said, hmm, yeah. Don't give up the day job, <laughs> which was then as a computer operator, which I'd taken leave from to travel around. So I just settled down for a career in information technology. Let's just roll the clock now forward. And I'm in my mid-40s, and I like this because this is because I'm running a consultancy. I've actually gone through an information technology. I've built up from being an independent consultant. Now running a consultancy with I guess 50 or 60 people at that stage. Offices in three states. You know, heading towards the public listing on the stock exchange. Captain of industry. The career path is clear in front of me. I'm married with a couple of kids. Everything's just fine. And then read a bookshop. I read the book that changed my life. <laughs> and that book was called The Unkindest Cut by Joe Queenan. Joe Queenan is an American film critic, and the book tells a story of how Joe set out to make a feature film, a full 90 minute feature film, for $7,000. To try to emulate a film director by the name of Robert Rodriguez who made a film called El Mariachi, very famously, in Mexico for $7,000, which he raised by selling his own blood. So this was a dedicated filmmaker. Now, our, our man Joe did not actually uh, raise the money that way. He got it on his credit card. <laughs> and the book, and then he made, and he made a film. He actually ended up spending a lot more than $7,000, even though he was just going to borrow the equipment cast his friends and so on. He ended up spending $50,000 or so, and he almost destroyed his marriage. And I'm reading this book and telling my wife, wow, amazing, his marriage is on the rocks now. He's just mortgaged the house. Good, finished, we've got to do this. And my wife said something like, what do you mean, we? I said, no, this is really cool, you're going to love this. And I had some, some weapons for him. The first one was that she was actually a frustrated writer herself. She had written two books, she had a very demanding full-time job, but she wanted to write. I said, look, you want to write, write a page a day. So she wrote a page a day, every day for a year, and at the end of the year she had a book. And then she repeated the effort for another year, and she had a second book. And both of those got to the final stage in a major publisher, just didn't quite get over the edge. She got herself an agent. They were saying, one more book, come on, you're almost there. And then she got the offer of a promotion at work. And she thought, hmm, Professor of Psychiatry, author. So she, she dumped the writing. I said, what well, I could do, you may never see your book in print, but we can film it. We can take one of your manuscripts, we can film this thing. You'll see it on the big screen. I was getting to it. And then, second point, another of her dreams, which was much younger, had been to be an actress. But at a certain point, auditioning for the school play, that said, you can be the tree. And she <laughs> she'd realised that the, uh, the wider world didn't appreciate her talents and had stepped away from that dream. I said, naturally, you will play the lead role. We will cast all our friends in this. And it will be like a time capsule. Our friends, the cat, the locations, our kids, and with your major birthday coming up in nine months, when we finish, and it might only take us a month or two to do this, it's just a bit of a game, we'll, we'll, we'll show it, we'll save it up, and we'll show it on your major birthday. And she said, 
how much is this going to cost? I said, nothing, absolutely nothing, just some donuts, you know, just, to, just some refreshments for the crew and so forth, because they're all going to be friends, nobody's going to be paid, we're just going to act, we're going to shoot this on our little home video camera. How can we go wrong? So, to cut an extremely long story <laughs> short, and I'm telling you it's an extremely long story, well, little highlight, well, okay, I'll tell you the, the end. On her 40th birthday, we all filled the Kino Cinema in Melbourne, which we had hired. You hired the Kino Cinema. What did that cost? Didn't matter anymore. <laughs> We'd spent so much money already. <laughs> it was a mere bagatelle. I hired the Kino Cinema, whatever, you know, you've already mortgaged the house. <laughs> which we had. <laughs> and we spent all the money, and we finished the film at 2 a.m. on her birthday. <laughs> Two o'clock in the morning, we finished the final edit, got the lip sync right, here it is, and we showed this thing. It was sort of a little dramatic in places because I, it was a drama. And people laughed, of course, in the first few minutes because they saw people they recognised on the screen, but you know what? They sat down and they actually watched it. It was a bit of an awkward moment in it because the guy there was only one bedroom scene in the, in the movie, but the guy in it hadn't told his wife. <laughs> and he excused himself from the birth of their baby to do it. <laughs> it was okay, the baby was born. And immediately he says, I've got a film thing to do. <laughs> and the, uh, the woman involved didn't speak to my wife for a few minutes, at least after the film. <laughs> Recovered it into 10 or 12 years. <laughs> so, um, and you know, look, I could write a book. I actually started writing a book about making the film, and I realised I'd lose all my friends. It was a pretty dramatic sort of thing, so I, after five chapters, I put them away. And that should have been the end of it, but it wasn't. Because what happened was that the director of the film, who was one of my colleagues in the early 20s, um, was also studying film, which is why she volunteered to direct it, experience. She took it along to RMIT, showed it to a class, and the next week I came along to explain. And we went to it and we talked about how we financed it and all those sorts of things and all the criticisms. You know, film students, they are so full of criticism. And there was a point where said, okay, how many people here have made a film? Hello. So I'm the only one, so shut up and listen. So, <laughs> So, at the end, the teacher said, you know, what I'm impressed about is, you know, there's lots of bad things in this film, <laughs> acting, and things like that, but, it, you know, the story holds together. Most films are unwatched, most first films are unwatchable because their student has some grand artistic vision that nobody else can follow, and you just, after 15 minutes, everybody's gone to sleep, but this is actually compellingly watchable. He said that. You did well to get, um, obviously, to spend some of your money on a professional screenwriter. <laughs> Getting this on film, Abel? <laughs> okay, body language there said, it was me. And a very dangerous seed was planted, and a year later I'd sold my business. And after that I enrolled in a screenwriting course at RMIT. And if you're going into a course to do any sort of further education, um, you want to get value out of it. It's not just about getting a piece of paper now. I wanted to be a screenwriter. And I knew I would learn better if I had a real story to work on. So before I went to the course, I needed a story. So my wife and I were walking in New Zealand. Um, it was the first real walk we'd ever done. This became a bit of a habit later in life. But we were walking in New Zealand, and I started working on a story. And every day I would tell the story all through the day, and then over dinner I said, like, okay, this is where it's got to, and she's a wonderful person, she listened to it over and over again, but where did the story came from? Well, what, what they'll teach you in, in writing and in, in film school is that really good stories come out of character. That if you've got great characters, particularly with humour, they almost write their own stuff. If you've got Maxwell Smart, if you've got Ron Paul or Bailey, or someone like that, if you've got a character like that, then that's what happens. And I'll tell you the other thing, because um, somebody, um, actually it was, I think the name of Margaret Rolson, 
who some of you might know, local local author was, was there last night and she retweeted that I said this, so it must have been profound. And I, I said that it's, it's profound but not original. The character is one third someone you know, one third yourself, and a third made up. So I started thinking about what might be an interesting character to drive a book. And I have a friend. And this friend is IT guru. He worked in the most technical job in the when I was working for a big insurance company in the IT department. He had the single most technical job, the job I had lusted after, but he got appointed ahead of me and I had the second most technical job there. And I remember we became friends because he came to see me one day and he said, you know, Graham, people classify you and me as geeks. I thought, oh my God. <laughs> He's calling me a geek. When this guy calls you a geek, you better sit up and take notice because he was the uber geek. <laughs> and we enrolled in MBA together and because um, he wanted to get out of that, that thing, he wanted to do a Master of Business Administration so people wouldn't think he was a geek anymore. And he didn't last long in the course. Um, he was too geeky for that. But I ended up staying the distance and ended up founding a consultancy and doing all sorts of life-changing things. The two of us remained good friends, went jogging together and so on and got to know each other well. And, um, let me just pick a couple of incidents out of our lives together, which will give you a little bit of a flavour of, um, well, if you've read the book, you might recognise them. Okay? There was a time that we were in New York together. We just happened to arrive, we just had a conference on, something like that, and a client had invited me out to dinner. And they said, you've got to wear a jacket. Because it was one of these New York State restaurants where the gentleman must wear a jacket. And I said to him, we've got this date, don't forget to bring a jacket. He wasn't a man I'd regularly seen in a suit. He said, no problems, that's fine. Did you get that? Before he left, my wife called him and said, don't forget the jacket. Because she knew him well as well. And we turned up and we're about to go to dinner and we're staying in the same hotel. And I said to him, hey, because I knew him well, let's see your jacket. And he's got this bushwalking jacket. Okay? <laughs> and we had this argument. He said, this jacket is superior to all other jackets. This jacket is not some you know, cosmetic thing. This is a, a jacket that is impervious to water. It's, you know, it's done good duty. It's got stains in it. All, all that sort of stuff. And we ended up going to a different restaurant. I had to ring my client and say, look, I'm sorry, but my friend didn't bring my jacket. <laughs> we told him, yes, I know. I told him, but it didn't happen. And we were actually a terrific dinner at a very casual restaurant. And thinking about it afterwards, because I actually really pushed him. I said, come on, we'll go out and buy a jacket. He's not a man without funds. Well, buy a jacket. Every man needs a jacket. And he said, no, I don't want to do it on. He didn't want to go out to the fancy restaurants. <laughs> and, you know, there's a lot, and I thought, wow, there's a lot more complexity sometimes than the simplicity that we see on the surface of these things. People know how it works. And while we were in New York, we went to buy a scarf. Two scarves in there, one for his wife, one for his boss. And he walked in and he said, into Hermes, I think I pronounced it right. He walked into Hermes and he said, I want two high quality scarves, please. And I said, Who for? He said, For two women, my wife, and my boss. How old are they? He told them. Well, this one would suit a woman of that age, and this one would suit a woman of that age. He said, Excellent, how much? They said nine hundred dollars each, and that was twelve hundred dollars Australian back in those days. And he slapped his American Express on the counter. I said, "Whoa, not so fast! You only see two scarves." And he looked at me and he said, "What do you know about scarves? You think you know better than these people? These are professional scarf vendors. They know all about scarves." And you know, it was one of those times you know, he was absolutely right. What did I know about scarves? Who was I to judge better than these two people? Who was what sort of scarf was right for a woman of 35 and a woman of 45 or, or whatever it was? And um, and so it went. And those that you, if you've read the book, you'll know that there are two incidents in there that, that um, push that along. But we talked about we talked about a character being a third, a third, a third. And I might have mentioned I wasn't all that good at dating. I don't think you can take someone like my buddy and just put him on the page. In the end, you've got to have it, that character. So a third of Don Tillman, at least, is me turning up at my teacher's house 
And in <laughs> oh dear, I'm not sure what to do with this. <laughs> or being in class and not being able to cope. And my thought is, that is where the depth of it all comes from. That what you see outside can only take you so far. But if you want your character to have depth, then at some point you have to inhabit it. So if you know, there's another character in the book called Jean. And Jean is a louse. Jean is a womanizer and so forth. And let me tell you, Jean is one third me. Um, and it's not one third me in the sense, and my wife might be watching this on YouTube, um, in the sense that I'm a womanizer, a philanderer, or anything like that. But you have to put yourself in that position. And there was this, I was a really awkward kid, if you like, and I got over that as well as one could. I learned all about wine. I learned all the social skills, and all that sort of thing, which was no real use to me because I was already married to a fabulous woman who accepts me who I am. But it's just one of these, those things that you need to feel you've done. And I had to take a woman out to dinner in Los Angeles the night before a um, presentation that we, were both, that we were giving together just to get the, get the story straight and all that sort of stuff and how we were going to work. And we went out to dinner and we went to a wine bar in Los Angeles and I got us a top table, we're going by the concierge and all that sort of thing. And she wasn't someone who dined out regularly. And here I was, and I was just, I just had this night of being the smoothest guy on the planet. It was just, I knew the wines, I could talk about the food, I could advise this, I could do the, I just, I had this well, I was pleased with myself. And at the end of the night, we both did and said, you know, if that had been a date, we'd have said it went well. <laughs> we were both happily married and, you know, we went off to our separate places and so forth. There was no scandal attachments or anything like that. But, I always think of that feeling that night, and that's the Gene character. I just think, imagine if you got addicted to that. Imagine if you just wanted to go out with someone and you have to say, wow, you're pretty hot, you look great, that was a bit super smooth, and you just got addicted to that because you weren't actually in the first place all that good at it, so you needed that affirmation, and you were really the dark side of Dom, but it's not to think about. Okay, so I took this, I took this character, and the Gene character, into my course, and I began with a story of, from the same friend who I had the fun with a scarf in New York with, because he was married, as you probably gather. And his marriage is a very interesting one. He's been married about 22 years, I think, and his wife is seriously ill. Um, she has multiple sclerosis, and she has epilepsy and diabetes, which are sort of side things, scoliosis. She's a pretty sick lady, and he has really devoted his life to her. And he does so in a way that most men wouldn't be able to do because of his extremely tight focus, his great intelligence, his technical ability. So he's found a reason for living in, in that. And I thought it was a story laid in there. So that was the original story, something like that, but I started off with a character who was a bit awkward, a bit wacky and so forth, but at the same time his skills would, um, would take him somewhere. And I saw this as a drama and I cast my Don Tillman character as a physicist. And I called the whole thing very pretentiously because I wanted you to learn about physics. The things we know, the things we'll never know, quantum mechanics, cosmology. That was my first degree, you see, so it's a big to me. And I called it incredibly pretentiously, my friend, the face of God. So you could have been sitting on a book tonight, <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> maybe that wasn't going to happen. Because I was learning, I was a student. And I rapidly learned, one of the first things I learned was that this thing was actually going to work better as a comedy than as a drama. And there was a, you know, the light relief bits, people just killed themselves over it. I, I workshopped a little story called The Jacket Incident, which found its way all the way after six years into the Rosie Project, about our, based on, it's not a bad story either, but based on that, inspired by and people laughed a lot, and it wasn't meant to be all that funny, but people were killing themselves laughing, and thought, maybe this works better as a comedy. And my comedy teacher was Tim Ferguson from Doug Anthony All Stars, a terrific guy, and he said, comedy writers are paid double what drama writers are paid, because <laughs> comedy's harder. We can all have drama, but comedy, making people laugh, is it? and this guy was making people laugh without trying. It seemed a shame not to, if I use the word, exploit it. And that was the issue. Was just the wrong thing to do. And my my feeling, are we laughing at disability? 
all comedy is about somebody who has some sort of lack. Generally, they're dumb. Okay, think Homer Simpson. Okay, but even then, often they're blind to things. Think Maxwell Smart. You know, oh, he's fine. He's everything except for the fact that he's stupid. You know? And you know, the comedy comes from people who are blinded in some ways who have a deficit. And you know, it's about and drama comes from overcoming that deficit. I thought, okay, Don is wired differently. He's way better at some things, not so good at others. And in fact, it's really a fish out of water story. It's really, I mean, if the culture was all, if everybody was like Don, he wouldn't have a problem. The problem is in this annoying foreign culture where a lot of people are neurotypicals, they're not like him. If everybody was like him, it wouldn't be a problem. So, and just like with Crocodile Dundee going to Los Angeles, sometimes we laugh at him because he doesn't get Los Angeles. And sometimes we laugh at the Los Angelinos because he's got a big knife. And so on. So, and that's the way, you, it's a delicate balance. But the Rosie project is half about laughing at Don. Make no mistake, we laugh at Don sometimes. And half of it's laughing at the world around him who doesn't get that maybe you should listen to the two women about the scarf because they know better. And what are we doing pretending we know about scarves when we don't? So I wrote it as um, a comedy. I called it the Clara Project. And the Clara, the woman, was a physicist, of course, just like Don. She had very heavy glasses and researched physics and played chess. And the only thing you needed to know was his social attitude. And I took it into my class. I entered it into a full screenplay, 90-minute comedy. It was shortlisted for the Australian Writers Guild um, new um, a screenplay. Yeah, unproduced screenplay awards. I was very proud of myself. I went to the class the next year to work on it. I had David Rapsey as a teacher. If you've seen Fran film many years ago with Nanny Hazelhurst and so on, some of you remember. David's a very accomplished Australian film producer and he said, this is garbage, Graham. And I was super shocked. And I said, hey, it got shortlisted for an Augie Award. He said, plenty of garbage gets shortlisted for an Augie Award. Nobody <laughs> from that committee is watching that. Um, but, you know, what, what he was saying was, it's got to be better. He was giving me a certain amount of tough love, and he gave me tough love for a full year. At the end of it, I said, so what do you think now? And he said, it's slightly better. <laughs> so I failed the subject. I didn't submit. I came back the next year. I had Ian Pringle as my teacher. Ian Pringle, best known for a romper stopper. You know the film? Not a romantic comedy. <laughs> Ian said to me one day, he said, what your film needs is a death. Preferably a violent one. And if you know the Gene character, that was who he had in mind. But and he had lots of advice, most of which I didn't agree with, but the deepest part of his advice was not good enough. And I kept working on it because I knew in my heart it wasn't good enough. And finally, in anger and frustration, I threw the whole thing in the bin. And the only things I pulled out of the metaphorical bin, because obviously it was on a computer in real life, I didn't smash my computer, all I kept was Don and his buddy Gene. In many ways, the characters that had the most heart, the two that had come out of, out of me, in many ways. Everything else stayed in the bin, including the plot. I didn't pull out the jacket incident, I was kind of like that. We kept the jacket incident. But the scarf incident and so on hadn't even been invented at that stage. And I welded on a, a new plot about um, the father, trying to locate Rosie's father. It was an idea I gave my wife 15 years earlier. And she played around with it, ended up rejecting, so I'll have that one back. Thank you very much. I think I can use it. Um, welded that on. Um, the hardest part of the whole deal was inventing Rosie. I wanted someone who was totally different from Don, exactly what he didn't want, but exactly what he needed. And that's a tough thing to do. I spent a lot of time with my wife, the psychiatrist, talking about what sort of person could Don think, you know, be someone that Don didn't want but needed. What does he really need? What does she need? Because in the end, Don had to be appealing to Rosie as well. Got it all together anyway. Created the Rosie Project. Um, won the Australian Writers Guild Award for an un un unproduced uh, romantic comedy script. Um, and then said to my producer, because I got a producer for that in Australia, I said, Roz, would it help if I wrote it as a book? Because we need to find funding. She said, only if it's a bestseller. <laughs> when you are a want to get a film up, you will grasp any straw or opportunity available to you. And I grasped at that one and it did the trick. 
I also cast my mind back to when I was 21 years old and wanted to write a novel. And this time I was older. I learned not to write about myself. First advice to young writers, don't write about yourself. Write about someone else because they'll end up being one third yourself anyway. So it gives you a little more distance. So I learned that. I had plot, I had characters, I had dialogue, I had everything except Don's internal thoughts which needed to go on the page. I've been living with them for six years. I knew that even if they went on the page, it took me four weeks. And it came, it was the best fun writing it because it was all done, all hard work was done. Four weeks to write it, three weeks to tidy it up, and one premier's award and the rest is sort of pretty much what Don said except just one, one quick story. That at, I sold the rights to text, um, the Australian publishing rights to text, because I thought they were the best publishing company in Australia. Um, I had some great offers, but I thought text was the one to go with, and this was not the best financial offer. Um, in fact, the financial offer was I was still working as a consultant part time to pay the bills. It was what I would have earned for three days of consultancy. So it wasn't going to change my life. I still had to keep the day job. And then in September, this was June of last year, so it's not long ago, it's only 12 months ago. Um, we did the deal with, it's less than 12 months ago since we did the deal with text. And then in September, Michael Haywood of text, the chief executive, called me up and said, we've sent the manuscript out to the foreign scouts and agents in advance of the Frankfurt Book Fair in six weeks' time, where all the foreign rights are negotiated. Now don't. Don't get excited, it's just to have a look at, but at the Frankfurt Book Fair, someone may want to not make an offer for the French translation rights or something like that. Wow, cool. But enjoy your walk. So we were just out there this walk across England. I said that, yeah, coast to coast walk across England. Um, and we got the phone call and start walking. We walked for three days to the Lake District and got no mobile phone reception. The end of it, turn on the phone, there's all these messages from Michael. Graham, please call me. Graham, call me. No, oh, please, this time. Call me urgently. Graham, I need to make a decision. Graham, I've had to make a decision. <laughs> so, oh, ah! and he says, well, I went out in the marketplace, and you know, 48 hours after I hit the scouts or whatever, he said, we got an offer from a German company, from a German publishing company, um, for the German rights, six figures in euros. And um, yeah, he said that it was 24 hours, take it or leave it. And he said, I left it for the last 15 minutes. <laughs> and another German company added 30,000 euros to the bed. I said, You took it, didn't you? <laughs> oh, yes, he said, we took it. He said, But now we've got interest all around the world because it's all visible. And Anne, my wife, and I walked for a total of 16 days for another two weeks in effect. And every morning I'm on the Skype to Michael and he said, we've got an offer from Japan, we've got an offer from England, they've got an offer from Penguin, they've gone up to now in random house, oh, blah, 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 blah. and at the end of the walk, we'd sold 12 countries, all the big ones, US, UK, and so forth, for good, good amounts. And we had a whole lot more in play, and he said, you'll do 20 to 30. Um, as of um, this month, we were at 38, and um, I got to the end on this horrible, wet, dismal day where we walked through mud and rain and I got to the pub, didn't even dry off and ordered a pint and I held it up and I said, goodbye to the day job. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really my story. <laughs> I would be more than happy to take questions if anybody has them. Alright. <laughs> No, have a mic, have a mic, because you have to walk. I think I went to university with Don. His name is Jeremy, and he once told me that wheat picks were far superior to cornflakes because of their density. <laughs> I deliberately didn't mention his name, for goodness sake, you blow it now. It's Jeremy. Oh, God. No, and somebody else said to me, and somebody else said to me that, is Don based on so and so's grandfather? <laughs> and yesterday, my co author of a non fiction book wrote to me and said, My sister thinks the book is based on me. <laughs> the sheer number of people, the sheer number of women who said to me, My brother in law, <laughs> this guy I work with, 
And it gratifies me because it's not based on my friend. It's based in, you know, he inspired, I hear his voice in my head, but I have met working in information technology and in academia. Let me tell you, every mathematics department, every physics department, every computer science department has a dom. And there's plenty of them working in other jobs, in hardware stores, bookshops, you know, whatever. You know, whatever you want to name it, you're making wine. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, oh, I've seen them in the wine business. The other people are saying, oh, you know, practice 22.87 by my... <laughs> This sort of stuff. Yeah. And so so there are a lot around and people recognise people think they recognise the character. So if I'm wrong, my yeah. question was going with that. <laughs> well uh, Who who's in your mind? Who are you casting? This uh, Steph is here tonight and, and I talk, I said last night there's only one question that always guaranteed will be asked. Every night will be, who would you want to cast as Don? And in, in the film, okay. Honest answer. First thing is, I don't get, I don't get to decide. Sony Pictures gets to decide. Fantasize. I know you're going to say. Money truck out the back. I know, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll give you. There's two choices. Okay. Choice one is you go for a standard comedian like Steve Carell, John Hamm, or whatever. And, and the, the positive is they'll do it really well. The negative is that it'll be the 17th picture of Steve Carell doing 40 year old virgin reprise or whatever. Or you take really brave and you do a crossover. You get someone who you wouldn't have thought of in a comedic role, but because they're such a great actor, they get they get to pull it off. Ryan Gosling, Ryan Gosling, Jude Law, Eric Banner, who's done comedy in the past. You you you, you cast somebody who wouldn't expect, and you get the same sort of result that you get when you cast a Jack Nicholson or you cast um, Russell Crowe in A Beautiful Mind or Dustin Hoffman in. Uh, Rain Man, he said, wow, they really pulled off something incredible here because we wouldn't have expected that. So, have an easy one. Rosie, <laughs> when I see pictures, who's seen The Great Gatsby? Mm -hmm. When I see pictures of um, Kerry Mulligan, mm -hmm. some of them not in The Great Gatsby, um, of several studios who bid for the Rosie project said Kerry Mulligan would make the Rosie. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And when I see pictures, I think, yeah, it's pretty much what I see Rosie in my mind. But the beauty of a book, is what I would say is please do not be put off reading The Rosie Project by the words Steve Carell. Um, because you may read it and think somebody totally different. I, I, the guy I really wanted is Cary Grant, but he's dead. <laughs> That's so true. I just play that back. Reading a book is not the picture, it's in your mind. And, and for me, I will always love a book. And yet there are people, and we're a book audience, like in a bookshop. But if you get a film audience, that's how the film is so much better. Did you see the cinematography? Oh. The beautiful, ah, it's just, but it's a different type of book. The book people, the book, and I'm one of them, the book will always be better. Um, for film people, they will see things that book people are not tuned into in the same way or don't break the same importance to. So how can it be just like a book? It's just words on the paper, the cinematography, the acting, the dimensions. It's like it's like reading a criticism of a song and said, obviously the the full electric version with all the instruments is better than the acoustic version. There's just so much more to it. And I happen to like the simple acoustic version. So. Um, are you the fellow that does all the, the demos and the age, the height, the BMI? Is that you or which character is that? <laughs> uh, that's part I made up. <laughs> I, I really don't. That's um, the no, there's the, yeah, yeah, there's a third, a third, a third, and, and it's, yeah, Don Tillman is partly people like me to know in the game, um, one, one friend in particular, um, partly myself, and it's like it's not really a third, a third, a third, it's like a half, a half, a half, <laughs> because it's overlap. The stuff that my friend's got that I've got, and <laughs> we do the same, but I don't know anybody who estimates BMI on people, so I, that's part that I made up. So a bit about, a bit about Don Don being a bit of a drinker, which is not just, you know, when somebody said to me, Don doesn't have Asperger's, people with Asperger's don't drink. And, yeah, um, some people with Asperger's do drink. And I've never said Don has Asperger's. <laughs> a lot of people with Asperger's syndrome relate strongly to Don, no doubt. I'm not a psychologist, I didn't base him on any textbook, I based Don on people I've met. But, you know, he enjoys a drink, so do I. So that came out of, that came out of my world. He's a bit of a foodie, which is, again, not typical. But I'm a bit of a foodie, so I, I chuck that in. So that's, that's a bit of me throwing into the character. But is he 
mix an obsessional food, he's saying so that's good. Well, you mix it all. You, you mix it all up. To, you mix it all together. Look, when I first gave Don an outing in a short story, people, uh, I said he had Asperger's because I sort of picked it up. Well, we use the term loosely in information technology. He's a bit aspy, you know. Um, and we would say those sorts of things, applying to most of our colleagues, which is how much aspy they were. You know? He's a bit aspy. He's not pretty, pretty average. So good on him. He's a lot aspy. Okay. He's, he works in the technical area, whatever. Um, and. I actually introduced him as this is a guy with Asperger's, just for shorthand, and all anybody wanted to talk about was the Asperger's. Hey, people with Asperger's don't drink. Hey, how can he have a girlfriend? People with Asperger's don't want to have a girlfriend. And this sort of junk. And does he wear socks? Because I heard that people with Asperger's don't feel <laughs> socks against their skin. And they think, oh, give me a break. And somebody very wisely said, you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. <laughs> And, and I really wanted Don to be a human being rather than some sort of representative. There was, there was one review that really, that really sort of cheesed me off because it was that sort of review that it said, it said a person like Don, that she said, a person with Asperger's would rather keep the routine in their life than have a relationship. And I put it to my friend, who I might add has never been diagnosed with Asperger's, oh, Temple Green, world expert on um, autism, this is Australia, which may still be here. So, you know, half of the people working in Silicon Valley have got Asperger's, but they resist diagnosis like the plague. Because, hey, these are people who are in jobs, they've got families, they don't want a label. And, and it's, it's something that's relatively recent anyway. Um, but I, I said to him, what do you think about this idea that people would, um, would rather have their routine life than a relationship? And he just about blew up with me on the phone. He said, you know, in the nicest possible way, I've spent 22 years with a very sick woman looking after her every need and so forth. It's broken my life apart in terms of organisation. You know, what choice did I make? I'm paraphrasing him. But, you know, he had every right to be angry. And people say sometimes they confuse lack of empathy with lack of feelings. And just because I can't figure out what you're thinking right now, doesn't mean I may not be hurt by it, or might not be hurt anyway. Because I don't have you know, sensitivity to other people, doesn't mean I'm not sensitive to getting hurt if my, if my partner leaves me. Is so the people amazed? Oh wow, Don gets upset. How could that happen to someone with Asperger's? So, you know, hopefully it just gets people thinking a little bit more. We've gone so quiet. <laughs> Look, um, I think it's probably a good time to, to raid the bar if it's still open, but particularly to raid that counter. I will be here for as long as it takes to, to sign more books, and I hope you'll support uh, Duncan and Di, um, who have been so kind to have me along tonight. Thank you very much indeed.